message, Revelations chapter 12 and verse 7 through 12, it says, and there was war in heaven. Now, if there's war in heaven, what do you think's going on down here? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives what? The whole world. He was cast out on Jupiter. He was cast out on the moon. No, he was cast out right where we live, right here on the earth. Somebody got to say, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. He was cast out right here. And his angels were cast out with him. He did not come alone. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his, of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down with which accused them before God day and night. You know, he's accusing you. He's accusing me every day. He's, he's, he's revealing our so-called shortcomings that he puts us up to. So he said, and I heard, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Do, do you love not your life unto death? Are you that strong in your faith? If you're not, take a listen today because we got some growing to do. Therefore, in verse 12, rejoice ye heavens because you don't have the devil fooling with you anymore. Rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. You're okay. But it says the next word is what? Woe. To who? To the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. But he wants us to think we have all this time. And he's, he's persuading us to just con, con, uh, totally waste time. And I believe that the two greatest talents that we have that we blow is our influence and time. You see, when we die, our influence kind of lives on. But until we die, we got just a little block of time that we're supposed to be using wisely. And if we don't use that time wisely, it could have eternal ramifications negatively. Amen? Amen. The story was told of a young couple that went to the Amazon, South America, to, to launch an evangelistic series and to live in the small village there and take care of the people and teach them about God. And, and they were there for a while and things were going well. I need to say, I was going to read this story, but it, it's, it might be a little long, so I'm going to try to put it in a nutshell. But they were there for about a year or so. But the wife took ill. She got cancer. So they needed to return back to the States. So in the meantime, the General Conference, this is where I've been, is, they sent a replacement couple. And this couple had two kids. And they went down there and the, 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 the doctor who, who was there at first went back to train this young man and show him the ropes, teaching the people he'd be rubbing shoulders with every day. He stayed down there about four months and he went back to the United States. And this man had things up and running and he was doing quite well. But understand that things happen. If you're living on this planet, things happen. Isn't that right? And I'm so glad that people are here with children because this man had children. And he had two daughters, like Maria. He has two daughters that he loved dearly. And he was helping other people. He was saving lives. And his two daughters came down with a rare disease he had never heard of. There was absolutely nothing he could do. And in 24 hours, they both died. That's one thing when you just lose one. But when you lose two, that's not good either. So needless to say, he became distraught. He lost interest in God, his wife, everything, his practice. He decided, you know, I can't do this anymore. He was angry with God and didn't know why God allowed this to happen. He felt, here I am, a doctor of medicine, and I'm helping other people, and my children get sick, and there's nothing I can do. Have you ever felt helpless like that? You can help somebody else, but you just can't seem to help yourself. So some time went by, and he mentioned to his wife, he said, honey, I got to get back in. I got I to find a reason to continue on. So he picked up the pieces, and he went back to work. 
He forebodingly walked through the door to start his business again, and before long, the villagers understood the doctor was back in. He said, I got to get in here, and I just got to take my mind off of this grief so I can serve God and I can move on with my life. But in the course of, of, of seeing patients, one particular day, a gentleman walked in to be seen for some little illness that he had, and in the course of that visit, this doctor, this young doctor, noticed that this man seemed a little different from all the people that had come in before. He was distinguished. He just didn't, he stood out among the villagers. So he said, I'm going to make it my business to get to know who this man is and what he's about. So he did that. He said, I'll just leave an open door. And as they were conversing, this man, this stranger, mentioned to him that he had some, some meetings going on. And he said, I heard that you're Adventist and you got some evangelistic meetings coming up. He said, yes, I do. He said, well, listen, if you come to one of my meetings, maybe I'll go to one of yours. So the doctor got to thinking, the wheels were turning. He said, you know, maybe that's true. He said, yeah. He said, how about it? He said, yeah, okay. He said, well, what are your meetings about? He said, they're about spiritualism. He said, whoa, whoa. Now, I, you know, my church, we don't believe in spiritualism. I, I, I don't go that way. So this gentleman says, well, have you ever been to a spiritualism meeting? He said, well, no. He said, well, how do you know you don't like it? He started working on him intellectually. So this man, the doctor, got to thinking, well, maybe God would want me to go and try to witness, and maybe I could win this soul to the other side. Well, how often does that happen? Right then, he began to do what we do sometimes, compromise. So he agreed, but he didn't tell his wife. Because you know what wives are going to say. Yeah, I know what mom would say. What's the matter with you? So we just keep it on inside so we can just roll. So he went on to this meeting when they were set up. And when he walked through the door, his two daughters came running to him. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Right then, that man was hooked. Understand, his daughters had died. You see, when we compromise, the devil is not playing games. He does not play fair. I read that verse in, in chapter 12 of Revelation, the devil has come down with great wrath. See, sometimes we think of wrath as a hammer, a gun, and a knife, but we forget that his kind of wrath is smooth things. See, wh whatever it takes for him to take you down, that's his wrath. He gets to the five senses. And whatever he can touch with your emotions, see, he doesn't play fair. So he takes advantage of our weaknesses. He doesn't show up like he really is. He, he, he's subtle. He's covert. He's not overt. We're expecting a drop kick, but he might kiss you just like Judas kissed Jesus. Needless to say, this man was hooked on those meetings. He went back. He returned day after day after day. And so finally one day, He's sitting in one of those meetings, and he came to himself and he wondered, how did, I, how did I get here? Did you ever find yourself in a situation that you put yourself in, and one day you just wake up and say, whoa, what, what am I doing here? And he said, this isn't good, but you know something? It was too late. Because he knew in his mind that because of all that he knew, that now he felt it was too late for him. So he said to the guy who got him into it, he said, listen, I want to talk to you. He said, I know with my background being Adventist and everything that, that, that I know there's probably no hope for me, he said, but I know that spiritualism, according to the Bible and Ellen White, is supposed to take over it in the last days. He said, I want to know. I want to see the big guy is what he said. So he said, okay, I'll take you to the big guy. So he went to the big guy, the guy was in charge, and he told him, I want to know how spiritualism is going to take off in the last days. And the man said, okay, I'll tell you. But when I tell you, you can't tell anybody else or you'll be dead in three days. So he told him. And he went home, and it was bothering him so bad, by the time he walked through his door, his wife saw that there's something wrong with, it, with him. And they started, she started sending letters back to the United States pray for my husband. He's acting weird. See, when you're involved with Satan, you're not going to be acting the same. When you know that you have no hope, you're going to be acting in some kind of way. And so when he walked through his doors, he told his wife everything, told them about their daughters. He said, listen, honey, it was our daughters. It was our girls. I saw them. I heard them. 
Now we can sit in judgment and say they're fools. But I'm going to tell you something. If you've lost somebody recently or lost somebody at all, if you don't know the Bible and that person came walking through your door in their work clothes, in their play clothes, with the same odor, with the same voice, the same cheer, and you don't know better, you're going to accept that lie. This is the drama of deception. Satan is headed somewhere with this. And he's conditioning our minds. Now I know, now I know better. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, I think it is. And I think it is Ecclesiastes chapter 5, chapter 9. Read it real quick with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Turn there real quick. Because the Bible will give you what? The truth. Amen? Ecclesiastes chapter 9. When you find it, say amen. Starting at verse 5. For the living know that they shall what? But the dead know not what? The dead don't know anything. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is what? Forgotten. Then it goes on to say in verse 6, Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion for anything that is under the sun. Now, if you read your Bible, and if you have a little bit of enough faith to just believe that, that, that dead people don't come back to life, then you'll know if an apparition comes in your door, that's not my son. That's not my daughter. That's not my mother. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. But if we don't have the Bible as a shield, so then how will we be all caught up in this spiritualism? So when this man said to his wife, they told me the, the tool that they're going to use. And this may not be the only tool, but it is a tool. You, you know what they said it was going to be? Television. So, I just bought a little of this. And this, is, this isn't necessarily a television, but any computer is a, is a television. And this happens to be an altar. Every home has them. Every home has them. I tell you, I'm going to step on some toes today because it's time to not give, cut stuff back. It's time to cut stuff out. This week, and usually if you're going to be preaching, you don't need to be watching TV. But last Sunday, it just hit me because TV has been bugging me to no end. You try to sit there and watch a program. Actually, they break into your commercials with programs. Are you feeling me? In other words, it's not, it's, not, it's not a commercial. The commercial is the program because it's all commercial. It's like going to a casino. There's a casino in the hotel. Oh, no. There's a hotel in the casino. But you sit there and you watch the, this, this constant barrage of hype, of sex, of violence, of nudity, of, of homosexuality. It's all there. And we as Seventh-day Adventists kick back because we had a rough day. And this is the way we relax. You see, after you, if you are addicted to salt or whatever, and you, you back off of salt for about a week, and then you eat something salty, it's going to go, mm. That's the way it is with this. When you get off of this and you go back and you look at it, it's like, how in the world did I even waste one minute watching that stuff? These reality shows, so-called reality, it's all hype. It's one thing when unsaved people, you know, get on there, the... Whoever, whatever name you want to pick out that's, that's, that don't claim to be Christian and you're watching their little charades and they're clowning around on camera acting like that's real life. That's one thing, but when you get Mary Mary 
And when you get Ben Tankard, and when you get people who are supposed to be gospel people serving God, and there they are with their lives, with their, their lives wide open, and they're making complete fools of themselves and shaming God while they're doing it. No, I can't buy into that. I can't buy into that. So what I have decided is, I don't want to watch television anymore. There's probably somebody in here decided that a long time ago. And actually, the Lord, see, see, if we will act when God tells us to act, we'd be far ahead of where we are right now. Because I believe back in 1991, he told me three things that give up meat, sweets, and television. I wasn't hearing it. Oh, well, I heard it, but I didn't act on it. So knowing the word and doing the word are two different things. But this stuff right here has to go. Now let's take a look at Romans, real quick. Romans, I believe it's chapter one. Because some people would think, well, if I'm just watching TV, it's not a big deal. Well, I beg to differ. Because as far as it's, it's concerned, the Bible says if you're thinking it, you're actually doing it. Romans chapter one, make sure I'm right here, and verse 18. There, there's like a catalog of sins in this passage. And everything that it's talking about is on that screen. Are you with me? Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which, because that which may be known, of, that which may be known of God is manifest unto them. So God has shown you it's manifested, for God has showed it to them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So in other words, you know better. For him to know to do, and, 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 but they don't do, that's sin. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, did, do you know God? It says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their what? Imagination. Now, that's an imagination box right there. You can go there. All your fantasies can come true. If not on TV and on the internet, all your fantasies. So it says, be became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Real wise, I go buy me a 60-inch plasma TV hanging on my wall, and I'm chilling. I, mine's bigger than yours. 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Let's jump all the way down to verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, is that on TV? Wickedness covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters. We just watch these. We gobble these soap operas down. Oh, I got to get home to watch that. Oh, yeah, I can't miss that. And if I can't see it, I'll make sure I get it on TiVo. Xfinity on demand. Verse 31. With un I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 31. Verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. You see all that without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. And here it is right here, verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they take pleasure and then they do it. We get, we get off on that. So in other words, we're condoning it. Well, I'll just watch this program till the next show comes on. I'm not watching it. Brother Kim sat over here one day and said, you know, there was a news story that came on. He said, I wanted to watch, and he's, no, he said, I'm not gonna watch that because if I watch it, I can't unsee it. That was the most profound, simple statement that I heard in a long time. You cannot unsee it. It's on your mental, it's on your subconscious. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. If pornography bothers you and you get a flash, it's not going away. So not only are we watching it, but we think since we're out of the box, that it's not affecting, no, you're in the box, you're in the bed. You're, you're pointing the gun. You're thinking those thoughts. 
Are you with me? Are you understanding what I'm saying? The devil knows exactly what he's doing. So spiritualism, there is there is a time coming when Satan will impersonate Jesus Christ. There, there is there is a um, a passage in, in in Revelation. I think it's in chapter 12 where he talks about the voice of Jesus. You know how it sounds like many waters. But it also, Sister White describes this impersonation when Satan comes at the, at the last days when he's trying to change the Sabbath and he's going to show up and he's going to be the most beautiful sight that human eyes have ever laid eyes on. And because we conditioned since television and because of our neglect of God's word has conditioned our minds to live by sight and not by faith, we're going to fall for it hook, line, and sinker in anything else that's left. When he steps up, and I'm, see, I don't know what Jesus looks like, but he does. But we don't have to know what Jesus looks like. When we see this being... It's going it's to be a done deal if we don't know God's word. He said his, his voice is going to be so melodious. Now, now, Lucifer led the choir in heaven, and he, he could sing four-part harmony at one time. He knows, what he, he knows how to do it. He knows how to bring it. And here we are sitting down, wasting time. Sure, he knows he has a short time. He also knows we have a short time. But he wants us to think that if we're 13 years old, we got 30 more years to go. You're good to go. Just stay right. Chill. So I'm calling people today. I'm calling as many people as will listen to stop watching television. No bones about it. I'm not talking about slow it down. I'm talking about don't watch the stupid bowl tomorrow. That's what I'm saying. Because it's coming and I don't want to see them. Go read your Bible. As you see, the little goblet, if you can see it from where you're sitting, and then there's a little cup next to it. The goblet is the wine of his wrath. We drink that pretty stuff on a daily basis because it's, it's, what, it what, it's what makes us tick. It makes me feel good. I just need a little something. But that cup on the side, that's the cup that Jesus had to drink. Father, if it's possible, can you remove this cup from me? And nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That's God's word on one side and there's devil on the other side. I, I present to you today, life and death, choose life. Am I making sense? Amen. This is um, a quote from Great Controversy, page 588. It says, the line of distinction between professed, professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Can't tell us apart. We're wearing the same thing. We're watching the same thing. We're saying the same thing. We're buying the same thing. We're doing the same thing. We're drinking the same. We're cooking the same thing. We're eating the same thing. And we're talking a lie. Hardly distinguishable. You sit in an Adventist church now in some places. Now in here, I'm being real with you, in here it's, I can tell you're Adventist. But in some churches you can't. Now I want to I wanna just say this real quick before I finish reading that. Okay, so what? If somebody's wearing something we don't agree with, at least they're still in church. At least they're still where God can reach them. But I'm talking about those people who have been here like forever who don't seem to get it. I'm one of those people. Just because I'm up here does not mean that I have arrived. It just means that I'm still trying to climb and I'm slipping and sliding just like you. But I'm holding on because I believe that Jesus wants to save me more than I want to be saved. Amen. Amen. It goes on to say, church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. See, that's, that's, that's where it's headed. He's grooming. He's setting people up. 
It's always going somewhere. He doesn't just willy-nilly throw stuff out there. He sees what's going to work for you. So I see I can get him to this precipice. Then I'll jump him over here. I can get him closer to the edge where there's a point of no return. He's working it right now. So it says, Papists who boast of miracles as a certain sign of the true church readily deceived by this wonder-working power, and Protestants having cast away the shield of truth. Having cast away what? The sh you, you don't have any defense. Have cast away the shield of truth will also be deluded, deceived. And then it goes on to say, papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the form of godliness without the power. I just want, as long as I can look the part, sometimes we care more about how we look than how we really are. All right, I feel like, a, I feel like, mm, but as long as I can look good, let me just put this on. I'm, I'm good. A form of God is not going to do us any good at the judgment bar. And they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long expected millennium. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of people. Oh yes, he can. He can put it on you and he can take it off. And when people see with our visual eyes, when they see miracles like that, they go, oh, he must be the real deal. That must be Jesus. Don't go there. And professing, he not only heals the diseases, and he's professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as a destroyer. So he's the little dog that's licking you in the face while he's peeing on your shoe. Hate to put it that way, but that's the way it is. Right in your face. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of people and professing all this stuff. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin, intemperance, dethrones, reason, sensual indulgence, strife, and bloodshed follow. You wonder why so many people are killing people? Just taking them out. Kill you quicker than look at you. Indulgence, intemperance. You see, if, you, if we can't control our appetites, you, your sin will not be controlled. There's a lot of evil people out there right now because they can't control their chicken. Can't control their chocolates. It, it goes both ways. In the book, um, it is the Commentary 7A, page 1006, Sister White says, he who will observe simplicity in all his habits, restricting the appetite and controlling the passions may preserve his mental power strong, active and vigorous, quick to perceive everything that demands thought or action, keen to discriminate between the holy or unholy and ready to engage in every enterprise for the glory of God or the benefit of mankind. Those are the only two reasons why we exist, to give God glory and to benefit mankind. If we're not doing anybody else any good, we're not doing God any good and we're not doing ourselves any good. But it starts with appetite and passion. Appetite, food, passion, things that we like, entertainment. Now, it's funny how the Bible says, do not kill. Actually, what it really means is do not murder. But it's funny how in, in, in the United States, if somebody kills somebody and it was a, like a love triangle thing, and they call it a crime of what? Passion. And it kind of almost like slap you on the wrist for that. Listen, sin is sin, Amen. But we've got to get our appetites under control. That's a biggie. But the way I dislike TV right now is the way I want to get to the point where I dislike sin. I want it to be a very bitter taste in my, in my mouth. I want it to be a very bitter taste in my mouth when I'm about to in, in, involve myself with something that's sinful. I want it to get to that point because Jesus hates sin. He, hates, he loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. We love the sin, and we hate the sinner. Something's wrong with that picture. But this thing about television, 
I don't have to stand here and I'm not going to stand here all day begging people to give TV up. I'm going to give you like the Bible gives you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, you shall find. Rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy and my bird is light, burden is light. Because that is an invitation. I'm not going to tell you to, and I'm not going to ask you to, but I'm going to invite you to make a stand today for your home, for your salvation. We allow television to babysit our kids after it has babysat us. We go to sleep with it. We wake up to it. Sometimes televisions are on all day long. Some people go out the house and leave the TV on. You knock on the door and you say, well, somebody must be there because I can hear the TV. Oh, no, they're not. That's just the way it is. And you know what they usually say? I can't stand it being silent. Sometimes, people, we need silence. Matter of fact, every day we need some, a period of meditation where we can hear God speaking to us. Even in our prayer life. Am I talking to anybody out there? Even in our prayer life, there ought to be a balance. Now, can you imagine you watch, let's say, for instance, 32 hours of TV a week? And that's easy to do if you go in at three hours a pop. 33 hours, 32 hours of TV a week, and, and maybe 32 minutes of prayer. Who's winning? God or Satan? It's not about who's winning, who are you conceding to? Who am I conceding to? So that's the seriousness of what I'm saying to you today. It takes time to be holy. And if you're not taking that time, God has given you 24 hours a day just like he's given me. And he gives the adults, the kids, the old people, young people, everybody has the same amount of time. It's what we do with it that makes the difference. Jesus is coming back soon. And for those of us who know better, you know, I want to go, I want to go to heaven. I don't know about you. Even as I go on my daily duties throughout the day, I see, I see some homes out there that really look nice. And, oh, that's a big home. That's a big home. And then I see, I'm starting to think like this. Boy, I wonder what my home is going to look like in the, in the kingdom. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And see, my mansion is going to be just the way I like it. I see some homes that are just what I call slamming. I'm like, wow, man, I'd like to just walk through there. Oh boy, wait till I see my home in paradise. Wait till you see your home in paradise. But before we get there, we've got to be fitted up for the kingdom. We've got to word up. That Bible sitting next to the computer down there means that it should really take the place of your TV, your computer, your iPad, your iPod, and there's one more thing, your cell phone. Now, I'm not saying give up your cell phone. I saw some lady over there looking. She's like, give me something to throw at him. Real quick. These are little bugaboos too. See some people, two people walking next to each other, texting each other. What happened to your voice? Can't you just say it? They come over your house to visit you. They're sitting over in the corner. It's, I mean, it's ugly. I'm telling you, it's just ugly. If we would stay in the word like we stay on our cell phones or our iPads or iPods, all this stuff coming in. See, the devil is, you, he's really using that electronics. He's using devices. And there's like de de demons attached to them.